7, 2017. Roll call, please. Chairman Elliott. Mr. Rabowski. Here. Mr. Burris. Here. Mr. Eisner. Here. Ms. Turner. Present. Mr. Glenzer. Here. Next, we'll hear from our, we're going to skip the minutes like we normally do. You guys good with that? Yes. And we'll put that at the end of the meeting. That's fine. All good. All right. So then we'll hear from our legal counsel. Um, and before I begin, might I make the suggestion that in the future, if you guys are going to continue to do that, then maybe we should move that on the agenda down after the applications before staff comments permanently. Okay. okay let's... And that way you don't have to announce that every time. That it comes right. That would be why they idea. pay you the big bucks. That I was know. good thinking. I know. I do what I can. Just trying to save you people some time. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, the minutes. Oh, no, I'm about to say something that's sort of important. <laughs> this is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Adjustment acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. Are there any members of the board wishing to disclose any ex parte communications or conflicts of interest this evening? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak this evening, if you could please stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. That includes the applicant and any witnesses. <clears throat> do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So sworn. Okay, next on the agenda, application 17-120, variance to reduce the required side yard setback. And we'll hear from staff. Uh, this is uh, Pat McNeese, principal planner. Uh, this is an application <coughs> for uh, variance to reduce the required side yard setback. Um, this is, um, comes to us from uh, Luke Bodine is the applicant. He's also the property owner. Uh, the location is 1171 Tooks Road, and uh, the zoning is R70. The land use is residential urban. A little bit of background. The applicant, as owner-builder, um, pulled a permit for a um, detached garage on a slab to be located on his uh, property. There is an existing single-family residence on the property. Uh, the permit authorized pouring the concrete slab and then um, installing the detached garage on the, on the slab. There was a pre-pour inspection done by building development, and that was passed. Um, sub subsequently, after the slab was poured, there was a post-pour inspection, and that was denied, uh, noting that the slab appeared to be in the side, side yard setback. Um, that was subsequently confirmed by a surveyor uh, showing an encroachment of up to 11 inches into the side yard setback. The applicant is requesting a variance from two sections of the code. Um, the side yard setbacks for detached garage, garage and for the R70 zoning district, both of which require a seven and a half foot setback. Uh, the requested variance is to uh, reduce the setback to six feet seven inches or 6.6 .6 feet um, where the slab currently sits. Uh, the request, if granted, would allow the applicant to install the garage on the newly poured slab. I'd like to highlight just a couple of things in the review criteria. Um, there, uh, as far as um, item one, uh, the property is not unique relative to, to the surrounding area and doesn't really have unique uh, characteristics um, that would require this or um, warrant this variance. Um, the board should note 
that uh, the applicant did pull a tree removal permit for a pine tree that was within the footprint of the slab. There were three other trees. There are three other trees in the vicinity of the slab. And um, the applicant, uh, those were evaluated by the city arborist at the time of permit application. But the applicant <coughs> um, elected to leave those trees in place and go ahead and pour the slab with those in place. Uh, the city arborist has reevaluated those trees, and her report is in your packet. Um, the circumstance uh, was, uh, as far as item two, self-created, but this was uh, obviously um, an unintentional error uh, on the part of the applicant. Uh, literal enforcement of uh, the code would not deny the applicant reasonable use of the property since the project was permitted in compliance with the code and can be built in compliance with the code. Uh, there would be no special um, privilege uh, given to the applicant by granting the variance since detached garages are allowed in this zoning. Um, and it's uh, as far as um, item five, um, the existing setback of six feet seven inches uh, would not sub substantially <coughs> negatively impact the neighborhood. Uh, it's staff's opinion that um, the basic um, uh, rationale and reasons for side yard setback are substantially accomplished with the, the six feet seven inches that's there now. The board may consider in addition to those criteria, Section 215.02e of the Land Development Code, uh, if you look on page four of your staff report, um, staff feels that this fits that circumstance of a building permit having been pulled and then a, a mistake uh, subsequently being made. Um, the applicant obtained the building permit, so that does demonstrate that the project would uh, does meet code and would have met code um, if built according to the permit. Um, the applicant states in his application that the um, his concrete contractor laid out the slab, um, laid out and poured the slab incorrectly, and that he can't rectify the error. So he doesn't elaborate on that in the application, but um, clearly a mistake was made. Um, the if the variants were granted, again, he could put the garage on the slab. Uh, if not, then the project would have to be modified to um, uh, remove the 11-inch encroachment. Building permit number 17-2012 was issued for the project. Um, staff feels that um, item three, that if the integrity of the slab uh, layout had been maintained, before and during the pour that this, this error could have been avoided. Um, number four is your, your normal um, criteria of uh, competent substantial evidence. And then at the top of page five, again, um, as far as the board uh, granting a minimum variance that achieves a result fair to the applicant in public, if the board were to grant this variance, it is staff's opinion that um, there would not be a substantial negative impact on the neighborhood with this setback. Uh, notices were sent to surrounding property owners. Uh, legal notice was published. The property was posted, and staff has not received any responses to these notices. Um, for the record, reading in the findings of fact recommended by staff, number one, the applicant applied for and received a city building permit number 17-2012 to install a detached garage on poured concrete slab on his property located at 1171 Tooks Road. <coughs> number two, a November 17, 2017 city building inspection and survey identified a maximum 12% encroachment of the poured concrete slab to the into the side yard setback from the required seven and one half feet to an existing six feet seven inches. Number three, the requested variance does not arise out of physical characteristics of the property or surrounding, surrounding area. Number four, the condition on the property for which the variance is requested has resulted from an action by the applicant, which appears to have occurred in error. 
Number five, literal enforcement of the side yard setback requirement of the land development code would require the applicant to modify the project as it currently exists in order to achieve the permitted layout and comply with the code required setback. Number six, granting of the variance would not confer on the applicant special privileges not allowed for other properties in this zoning district. Number seven, granting of the variance would not injure or impact the rights of owners of affected properties or create a nuisance or otherwise substantially, neg substantially negatively impact surrounding properties. Uh, page six has your staff recommendation. Based on the materials submitted by the applicant, the request does not meet all of the review criteria established in the Land Development Code, specifically Section 215.02b. The criteria in Section 215.02e are also not entirely met based on the materials submitted by the applicant. Staff recommends denial of a variance for relief from the minimum <coughs> side yard setback. All right, do we have any, <clears throat> do we have any questions for staff? I have a question. Mr. Burks. On the application, was the applicant permitted to cut the roots of the remaining trees? Um, it, you're referring to cutting the roots um, as uh, outlined in the city arborist report? Correct. By the inspection here on the three trees, he mm -hmm. made an extensive explanation with pictures. That yes, he that's cut the roots of the trees. Yes, was that permitted under the application? Well, um, apparently, um, the the applicant elected to leave those trees in place and not um, uh, apply for removal of those trees. Now, our code is um, there. There are some difficulties with the code in that tree removal means um, cutting it, cutting a tree down, or damaging a tree to the extent that it will die in two years. Apparently, there is um, a little bit of, of uh, gray area with respect to um, whether the arborist would would um, determine that those trees would die. So. Um, it was permitted with the trees in place, what, knowing that, that there would have to be some root removal. Do we know what the height of the garage will be? The height? I'm not sure. That's also not can... relevant to the application. No, the reason I'm asking the question is because when, on one of the pictures, one of the trees. Uh, it would be under 20 feet. but One of the, <coughs> of the branches of the trees right over the garage itself. How high is the garage itself, and will he end up cutting the tree again? Uh, the garage would be under 20 feet. I don't know exactly how high it is. We'll get to that. Okay. So we don't know how high. No, under 20 feet, but okay. exactly. More? No, thank you. Uh, yes, unless I misheard. It sounded like there was a pre-pour inspection mm -hmm. that did not uncover the mistake, and it was only found after. That's correct. There's a documented pre-pour uh, report or something that showed that it was in compliance prior to the, the pour? The pre-pour inspection was approved by the inspector. So without really pointing fingers, it could have been uncovered at that point. Had the inspector noticed the... If the layout was incorrect, yes. I'm not So sure. at that time it was correct? I'm not sure, but I would assume it is based on an approved inspection. Okay, I guess then it just says that it must have, if it was correct at that point, it must have moved prior or after that inspection, it must have been adjusted. Correct. Is that the inference of that? I think, yes, I would okay. say yes. <clears throat> All right. And, and going off of that, um, <laughs> so, you know, the footer inspection that happened on November 13th, so that was the I'm similar kind of question that I'm asking is somehow something has possibly moved in four days. Now, I'm actually in the middle of doing a mm -hmm. project at my own home, a 10 by 10 edition, and my footers 
So this is a much smaller thing that I, I, I'm building, just a little 10 by 10, and I have poured footers. Mm -hmm. How would a poured footer move? I'm not sure. In four days. I'm not sure. Was it the same inspector on the 13th and the 17th? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Anything else for the city part, staff? Part of the reason I asked that question is that maybe I'm missing it, but I didn't see it noted in the staff reports that there was a pre-inspection that complied and a post-inspection. But when you were talking about it, yeah. you mentioned it. Am I missing it, that there was um, a pre-inspection? Oh, you mean a copy Actually, of the inspection? hard copy where I was... did not include the, the copies of the inspection. The, the, the pre-inspection is just approved with no comment. The post-poor inspection would have okay. have the comment, but I did not include those in the... And also the packet materials are up to the applicant to put forth for you to consider. So the staff doesn't necessarily have to produce evidence for you to consider. It's going to be the applicant that should produce those types of things. Okay. Understood. Mr. Eisner. Did the uh, pre-poor and the poor, were they both laid out by the contractor? I don't know the applicant would have to tell you that. Okay. The applicant is the contractor. It's an owner builder. He's an owner builder. So he's responsible to make sure his subs laid out everything correctly. Okay. So if there are no more further questions for the city staff, we'll move on to the applicant. You may present your case, sir. And while the applicant is coming up, because we don't see this very often, the mistake. Uh, provision there is an, uh, another you know the 215.02 e of the land development code I just wanted to point out that this is much like your regular criteria is it does have an and so all of the things need to be met not just one or the other just because we don't see it very often Thanks and please state your name and address good evening my name is Luke Bodine I'm the owner of 1171 Tooks Road and here's a couple papers I made too that kind of illustrates what we're talking about it's just the corner that's in question so again like we were um questioning so the the footers are those poured footers <laughs> yes ma'am so the poured footers were inspected and improved on november 13th yes ma'am and then on the 17th, this magically, as your pink line. There's, there's no alterations made. It's exactly as the city inspected it. That, that's the, the slab was inspected. The footers were inspected by the city. And it was poured exactly the way it was inspected. And it passed. So that's why the slab was poured. Was it the same inspector both days? I don't, I'm not sure. I wasn't there for the first inspection. I was there for the, the after the fact inspection. Do you have anything else to present? Uh, just, um, it's just a corner that's really in question that it, it kind of tapers back to six foot, six inches while the front of the garage actually it's added space it's eight foot six inches that's more than what was actually approved in the beginning um it just if i were to change the slab it'd be economically impractical it'd be jackhammering a, a 24 foot by 50 foot concrete slab out and repouring it uh, the way this building is such that i'm purchasing and needs to sit perfectly in the corners of the slab and there's actually recesses that are poured into the concrete and it just alterations to make the building fit this would not work without taking the slab out and to answer the questions about the trees though the depth of the footers were not such where it impacted the roots of the trees and the center of the building is 13 feet tall while the tree branches are 25 feet in height so it does not imp impact the trees whatsoever So it's a prefab building that you are looking to put on this slab. Yes, ma'am. So that's where it's you have your yes, set it, specific. It, it needs to be perfectly, like the slab needs to be exactly perfect for this building to sit onto the slab. 
and there's recesses poured all the way around the building that that lit the it's like a, it's like a metal foot i guess like a metal footing that the building attaches to that needs to be perfect otherwise the, the structure won't sit on it perfectly any more questions yes um <clears throat> you mentioned that uh the concrete contractor i guess that would be your subcontractor right? yes um, they were provided with the plans and the measurements and and all of the things to do their job correctly, right? Yes, sir. And in your notes, it says that they are not able to correct the problem. That's correct. So is there any fault with them in laying it out? Yes. I gave them a detailed set of plans and blueprints of... So why wouldn't the remedy be for them to fix the problem? Because they're unable or unwilling to rectify the problem. They basically said that they did their part and they're unwilling to help me. No, I have no questions. It's not a pretty sight, but it's... Mm -mm. Yeah, so um, I do have a question for the city. I know, at least I recall, that when roofs are done, there is an in-process uh, survey that is supposed to be done where they come out and actually witness it. So they, they do it beforehand, during, and then after, right? Is that the same thing that is done when they're pouring a slab? Is there supposed to be an in-process inspection done? I don't know, but Heather. I mean, there were there were only two inspections. So, so it, for this type of structure, you're not talking about a house. <laughs> it's a detached structure, so it, it gets a little less scrutiny. Um, essentially, there's an initial an initial um, inspection for the form to make sure the form matches what's on the site plan. That was what was done, and that was what was approved. At some point in the time between when that was approved and when the actual slab was poured, there was an error that occurred. Whoever was responsible, that the city can't really, I can't tell you who was the one who, who, who that occurred. All I can tell you is it happened. Then when it was caught, there was at the final inspection for the slab itself, because you're dealing with a prefab structure, there's a little bit different. The slab is dealt with separately from the actual structure itself. The structure will come a little bit later. So at the time of that final inspection for the slab, that's when the error was caught. So there is no in-between phase where the, the inspector's out there when the, when the slab's being poured. They're there at the beginning to make sure that the form, everything <coughs> matches, and they're at, the en they're at the end to make sure that it m was poured correctly. In this case, <coughs> sometime in the process between that pre and that post, there was an error that occurred which resulted in the slab being incorrect on that one corner. That's right. Um, in the pre-inspection, um they're there to check the rebar and what is what is in their uh pre-pour phase what is what is inspected do would they put a ruler and see that they're in that setback they would they would they would actually take a tape and make sure that they would pull a tape to make sure that from the property corners that are surveyed out that the the structure or form of what you're going to pour is consistent with what the plan state because what I'm, I'm having trouble, to be perfectly honest, is why would a contractor, a, uh, a cement contractor, shift this? You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just, this is I my don't own. think it was done, as the staff report states, we don't think it was done intentionally. No, I know that. Somehow an error occurred. We don't know how that happened. Well, it just did. But if I have to sit and make a decision of whether the... Uh, error was done by moving this or whether it was done by um, missing the inspection on the onset i can't tell you that i know that I can, but I can what we you have to make a decision on that the, accepted the accepted what was out there for the form for the pre-inspection that's all that we can tell you we can tell you that's what we have the information we have for them uh was the i'm sorry please was the uh Con the concrete contractor also in charge of, I guess, uh, the survey line and placing the silt fence or the yes. Yeah. So because I'm I'm just 
guessing that the fact that the silt fence can't go through the tree, it had to go around the tree, and thus kind of gave the illusion of being parallel to the silt fence rather than, you know, if it would have truly, if the silt fence would have been truly placed parallel to the, to the line, I'm wondering if that was something that, you know, if it, I, I guess I'm still pointing back at the concrete contractor myself. I, I really can't give you an answer towards that. I can just tell you that I gave them the blueprint of where the property line was, and it needs to be seven and a half feet off of that. And I mean, that's... That's and and so supply. by virtue of the picture, it would, it would appear that the property line goes directly through the tree. Uh, no, because it's actually a double, it's like a double lot type property. So the trees are actually in the center of the property. Oh, it's on the other side. I gotcha. That picture of the silt fence <clears throat> with that tree is not on the side that is in question. No, it's not. It's in the center of the property. Never mind. But it could be used in the in the measuring by in error. Right. That's what I was looking at. Because I mean that that big of a variance to your eye, you would see that if it was parallel to the silt fence, and the silt fence wasn't, you would have seen it during layout, Mr. Burroughs. Yes. Is the uh, <coughs> concrete contractor licensed? Yes. Is he licensed to set up this or just to pour the concrete? He is a fully licensed concrete contractor. And bonded. And bonded. Yes. And you have recourse on it. I suppose. You have a way out. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Does it not adapt for some reason? I, I'm, a, I'm a firefighter. I'm not, I don't have endless amount of funds. I, I don't have a lot of money to take someone to court and sue them. So that's why I'm here tonight. It was, all, it was an, I think it was an honest mistake. I, I, as soon as I figured out that this, that there was a problem with, the slab being over the, the seven foot six, I came to the city and actually told them of the problem. I'm not trying to hide anything or cover anything up. So it wasn't disclosed by the inspector? No, sir. So they didn't figure it out. You figured it out. The, it was kind of two parts because I had an inspector come out. Coincidentally, I had him come out by accident, actually. And he had said that it looks like it's over the property line of where it's supposed to be. And I had measured it, and it was actually um, too far close to the property line. That's when I came to the city and told them I was wrong. Okay. And once again, so when the city inspector came out the first time, Heather, they would have measured. They would have measured. So Correct. somehow that just doesn't make sense me to me. Either. <laughs> I don't know how they could measure it and then it's changed. Right. I, I don't um, know. It's, so yeah. are there any more questions for this gentleman? Um, okay, so uh, people in the audience supporting the applicant can come speak, please. Can I just add one more thing? Yes. Just I spoke with all my neighbors and they're all fine with this. They, nobody has objections. And actually the neighbor that lives on the property line, he. <laughs> He actually likes it. Prefer he prefers it the way it is, with the garage clock the way it is, instead of closer to the property line in the front. So, thank you. I appreciate that, and sir. If you could approach the podium and state your name and address for the record. One minute. One minute. They already. My name is Walter Piper, one one six eight Tooks Road. And I'm one of those old gentlemen who walk around every day and look at things. So I watch this thing being built. I watch the steel going in, and I know they didn't move it after they put it in. It was formed uh, wrong by somebody, and uh, I wished I would have got my ruler out and measured it because it even looked wrong to me. Tonight, I went out and measured it, and in the center, it's only two inches off. In the front, it's eight and a half feet instead of seven and a half feet. So I went and knocked on the door of the neighbor there, and I asked him what he thought. And he came out with me and he said, looks good to me, I like it wider in the front. And who cares about the back? It's pat, way past their house and everything. So he had no objection to it. Uh, 
the question that I was listening to was what happened between the inspection and approval of the footing and everything else. Uh, I can tell you nothing moved because every day I walked by and I didn't see them lifting all that steel out of there and moving it over and everything else. Uh, it's a big slab to... Uh, I've got Luke's name now because I asked him tonight. He's new in the neighborhood. He's made his house look wonderful. We like him in the neighborhood, and we'd like to see him not have a major, major problem. Uh, besides, it's nice to have a fire rescue man close by. So I can tell you that there was no movement after the inspector inspected it and said, and I watched every day, I watched the steel go in and everything else, and I thought, wow, that's a big garage and a nice slab. And so I hope that uh, because there aren't any objections that you'll find for this young gentleman and help him out. Uh, it does give a variance at the very end of it, but it gives too much room at the front and nothing wrong with having too much room at the road front. Sir, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, did you witness the city inspector come out to the property and take measurements? No, I didn't see the actual inspector come out. And are you there daily keeping an eye on this project? Oh, I just, no, I walk every day. And when I'm walking, I'm walk, seeing what's going on everywhere in the neighborhood. So, Mr. Bodine, were you, do you know of anybody that was there when the city came and inspected it? Uh, while I'm up here, I, I might as well preach something else. Ten years ago, they promised us sewer lines. I hope you guys can get a variance and get some sewer lines in. <laughs> I talked to the mayor and I said, you let them put a lift station at the park right there. Then the engineers at the lift station said it would handle our whole street. And the mayor told me, we can't pump your sewage into the county or let it go into the county. But that lift station puts it in the city. So uh, if any of you have anything to do with that, I'd appreciate your help. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think that's part of our uh, purview. But uh, wait, do you have some questions, sir? Well, not, not for the general. Um, this is for staff. Is there a provision in our criteria for contractor errors? The, the section um, 215 uh, E, O2 E, <coughs> is, is that provision. Oh, okay. Right. So we do have that. Yes. Do we have any provision for inspection errors? Um, not in your criteria, and I'm not sure if we... Uh, why I asked this there was a why I asked this question, and I don't mind making this a public statement. I've had a house built here in 2014. Okay, so this is going to be considered testimony. Okay, and so I'm sorry. And and I understand your situation. Sure. I know what you want to say, well, and that's okay. But it's going to be considered testimony in which you're you're not able to testify. Correct. So okay. <clears throat> I understand. But I, I, I get what you're saying. And to piggyback, there's no, the only exceptions to this for any types of mistakes in the construction process is the 215.02e. Right. So there is no provision for um, any potential other errors other than the contractor or the, the owner. <coughs> Mr. Burroughs. Can we get a report of the pre inspection? I, I don't see how that's relevant to. It is relevant. Well, it for, it's not, though, because here's the, the thing is the applicant has the burden of providing you the evidence that you are to consider for the application. It's not staff doesn't need to provide anything. Uh, the Mr. City Bodine, were you provided any written evidence of someone inspecting? Yes. You were before the, the pre-inspection. Do you have it? So for clarification, it has to meet all the criteria of 215.02b and 215.02e. It has to meet the criteria of 215.02e, um, all of the criteria in all, order all to meet the one, exception okay. for the mistake. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Discussion? Or will or are there anyone in the audience that would like to speak against the applicant? Seeing none. Uh, any rebuttal by staff? No. Any rebuttal by the applicant? Deliberation. What do you got? Hmm. I'm going to go back to my original statement. It was it's very easy for them to for the city to make an error in measuring. I find it very hard to believe that a contractor <clears throat> who's doing this on a day-to-day -day basis is going to move, you know, footings or move concrete for any reason. I actually consider the extra witness, a uh, competent expert, being as he walks every day past oh, there. Let's be clear. He is not qualified as an expert. There has been no testimony to qualify him as an expert for the purposes of he this person. I'm, I'm saying he's an he expert an eyewitness. He, could, he is not an expert at all. I'm going to ask that he's... And, not, and that part of the, the hearing is over, but I'm going to say he has not been qualified as an expert. But he doesn't but have he to be. Can, a... He can provide testimony like he did as an eyewitness. So that testimony and can be competent, substantial, yes. as long as it is relevant to the proceeding. It can be competent and substantial, Co okay. regardless of being an expert. Of expert, okay. Con Correct. Correct. Then I, I withdraw and say my feeling was, as we deliberate, that it was competent, substantial, that there wasn't anything shifted magically and that the initial footer was incorrectly placed but the inspection by the city that should have uncovered that was where a much needed check was missed right. furthermore he, he discovered the error himself and reported it to the city being an upstanding citizen so the city did not <coughs> I had That's asked, the first time or the second time. Mm -hmm. um, yes, since the city is denying, and we are in an area where it's a gray area, whether we say yes or no, my suggestion is that we postpone it for the next time and get that report from the gentleman himself. My only question to you, George, when getting that report, staff is not denying that that the uh, inspector passed it. So it's not no, like the attorney said that we should not consider it. He has that report. We should have. No, I didn't say you couldn't consider the report. I said it's not part of the ap evidence that the applicant has put forward. Then it's on the burden for the applicant to put the evidence forward. The yeah. board doesn't really have the purview to request more additional evidence from the applicant. It's not up to the board to prompt the applicant with what they need to provide. The other thing, too, is that testimony that was given is that the, the, the inspection did pass on the first one. Then there was additional testimony that from, from the witness that said that nothing was moved. And then there was testimony saying that it passed on the second inspection. You were only to consider the testimony that was given. You also had testimony from the owner who said that the contractor screwed up. So it's up to you to take all of that evidence, and some of it is conflicting, <coughs> and determine what you believe to be the truth based on all of the evidence that's presented and whether or not it meets all of your criteria in addition to the exception criteria that's there. So you all need to make that decision, but that wasn't provided by the applicant, so it's not for you to consider. On a previous um, case, I wanted for my own education and, and building my knowledge of how um, our criteria works, I had asked um, the staff to clarify something that, in knowing that our city employees were human, we're, they're, they're going to make mistakes to where there, there would be a mistake. And I, and I had actually, you know, we had had the conversation um, with, with Kim. Kim and I had talked and had brought it up with Heather of if be it an inspector or a permitting or whomever as, as a city employee if they were to make a, an honest mistake um that would then necessitate a homeowner or a property owner coming before this board and 
I was assured that if it was known that the mistake was on this city, that there isn't always the necessity to bring it before the board because the city owns our mistakes. So I'm just curious. It makes me think back to that conversation of what happened between inspection one and inspection two. Well, sir, I, for one, be happy to have you, you know, at least a couple of inches, uh, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's common sense that you should be allowed to move forward to, given what happened, that it was a genuine mistake and you caught it and you honestly came forward. <coughs> so it's up to this board to make up their own, uh, you know, I'm, I'm simply one book, uh, but they will. We're about to go for a motion to either approve or deny. Any more comments before we do that? Yes, I just want to again reiterate that I don't believe in, in my head. I, I would just say I don't believe that this moved um, from that first inspection. I agree. I do agree. I agree with you. Uh, to me, that's obvious. And if the, if the, it's a, either a mistake by the um, cement contractor who placed it incorrectly. I could see that that happened, and I could also see that I don't know what the situation with the inspection, the uh, first inspector, whether he caught this or missed it. It seems inherent upon the city to catch something on the front end so that we don't wind up here. Correct. That's why they do the inspection to make sure it's done right. So if they're not going to do that properly, then we're going to have a lot more cases here. So somebody has to be instructed to check it, check it twice, cut once. It seems that the city went out of their way to, to provide us pictures of trees and everything else, the names of the trees and all that. And we're missing a basic inspection of the concrete. That it doesn't... But George, even if we had that inspection, it would show that it passed. It doesn't actually show. But he's saying they gave us a lot of information well, about yeah, trees, I but agree. nothing about Oh, concrete. I agree. But so I guess. And to chime in, the tree stuff is irrelevant to this application. So why is it in the application? I, I don't control what goes in the staff reports, okay. but I can tell you from a legal point of view, the trees are irrelevant. I, I agree with that. So we're yeah. going to go for a motion. <coughs> I make a motion to approve it. I second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Mr. Glenzer. Yes. Ms. Turner. Decline. You can't decline. Or deny me. I'm sorry. So no on the motion? No. Mr. Eisner? Yes. Mr. Burris? Yes. Mr. Obowski? Yes. Okay, sir. You've been approved. You can have your building. I believe you have two years. Thank you for your that. service also, and welcome to Tarpon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will now move on to approval of minutes. Do we have a motion? <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, approval of minutes, November 29th, 2017. Do we have a motion? Um, I move for approval. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. Roll call. Mr. Glenzer? Approve. Ms. T Turner? Approve. Mr. Eisner? <coughs> Approve. Ms. Burris? I mean, Mr. Yes. Burris? Yes. Mr. Obowski? Yes. Okay. We now move on to staff comments. No comments. Thanks. Any board comments? Oh, those could only get me in trouble. <laughs> Knock yourself. Am I allowed to speak now? Yeah. We're just that. I said you couldn't talk about that one thing because <laughs> that was testimony. You want to talk now? I definitely do. As long, as long as it is relevant to the things that this board does, you're welcome to speak. Well, I just will know for a fact in my own cases that mistakes happen. Yeah. And I pretty much caught many of them 
some of them I didn't catch, that the city didn't catch, and I'm still living with them. So that's where I feel, you know, this this happened, and I don't believe that that ever moved. That would be absurd to move rebar, because rebar has to be all tied together. It has to be strung, and that's the pre-pour that they saw, and it would be, it, it's almost impossible to move a structure like this once it's pre-approved from the pre-pour, so. That's where I have to. And actually, um, I did have a meeting with Jay, and that's where I was trying to go back to competent expert. Okay, throw out the expert. I was fully prepared to go the other way on this, fully prepared, I wish I until that pre-inspection. That pre-inspection for me provided me the, the feel-good about a, a, a approving that such permit based on competency of everything about it. It just, to me, that just was the deal clincher. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with the hardship. I threw that out. It had nothing to do, obviously, with the trees. Trees, different, different deal. Um, it was purely, he proceeded with the poor because he had an approval and he shouldn't be penalized. Now, up until that, I was still even going against him because I feel he has a beef, a major beef, and I think the city would have a major beef with the concrete guy who laid it out incorrectly. But that's not up to me to decide his financial hardship of not being able to go to a lawsuit to, to find that solution. But all of it would have been averted with a correct pre. It would have been simple at that point to fix everything. And it would have been the contractor's fault. Don't pour this. It was not approved. Right. So it, it was a mistake that was caused by another mistake. So, and that's why I feel, I, I feel like we did our job and we considered the competency of everything that was there. When I had my uh, pool footings done <coughs> in the back of my house, um, the pool contractor on one side of my house had it at 22.6. On the other side, it was 23.6. So I had exactly what he has here, except his is a total parallelogram. Mine was a trapezoid. And uh, <clears throat> they pre-approved it. They pre-approved pre the form. And we didn't realize until it was <coughs> completely poured that it was wrong. And luckily, it's only holding a structure of light aluminum, not a house or a garage. So all I had them do was drill in and pour it out so that everything was 23.6. And that's how I got around it. But these things happen more than you would know. <coughs> I would agree. Yeah. So that's where I was going with this, because a 24 by 50 like this, that's a big slab. It's a big slab. They have they're rated on the type of rebar they use, whether they're using size four or five. Um, you know, the perimeter has five, the inside has four, and these are all tied together. It well, before that pour, and they probably have to have um, plastic underneath for termite. So there is no way somebody's going to shift this a foot. You're not lifting it. You're not moving it. And there would be, there's no reason it would have been shifted either. Exactly. Yeah. And, and who would move it a foot to throw it out of spec to have to go through a variance? So oh, we, all, we all agree <coughs> on that. And that's, I guess, that's, you know, where I was asking is like, was it the same inspector that came out, that. you know, four days difference? You know, the inspection day one, it measures okay. And then, you know, four days later, someone has a I bad tape, tape measure? I mean... <laughs> It just had a, they had a, a question for you. Had a yeah. metric, you know, metric. They had a, they I mean. had a standard, <laughs> something like that. Go on. My yeah. wife. And, and that, been again, doing you know, because I, I had this conversation with staff before. I hate punishing a property <laughs> owner for an honest mistake that an employee can make. Okay, I found there is a contradiction here. Uh, the city says we have to meet all five criteria. It's the law says you have to, not the city. The law. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this case, the 
in the past we have a problem with lawsuits. Supposedly, if we decide against what the staff recommends, no. in the future we may have a lawsuit. Uh, can you relate to this case any possibility? Let's say it was in a garage and it was a structure like this, and it will end up in court. Well, let's be clear. It's <clears throat> not when you go against staff recommendation. Right. You don't have to rubber stamp staff's recommendation. <clears throat> I will tell you, I have reviewed some staff reports where I disagree with the staff analysis. And I think that where they say it should be a denial, I think it should be an approval. Where they say it should be an approval, I think it should be a denial based on the law and based on the, the packet application. But what staff recommends can also change based on the testimony that the applicant brings. So the applicant presents this and says, this is my application. This is evidence for you to consider. But then the applicant comes and can bring witnesses like the gentleman did tonight. I don't know if he brought him or if that man came of his own volition. And then they provide additional evidence that's not in this packet. I mean, he provided you with evidence that was contrary to what the staff had a report of and to what was in the packet. And so you're to consider that evidence and to weigh the credibility of that witness and determine whether or not then it meets the criteria. And that information wasn't in the packet for staff to, to consider. So, no, there's no, I can't provide you with a case that says uh, you went against staff recommendation and therefore then that person sued. That, that's not how it works. The reason I place the point like this is this. Uh, <laughs> there, is, there was a report where when we had the meeting with the commissioners that in a previous board of adjustment, the numbers were 9%. All of a sudden, this board has 27% approval versus the city denial. Mm -hmm. That's why I asked the question the way I asked it. Why is it a, uh, was a point made that we are going against the city decision, so the staff decision, 27% mm -hmm. of no. the time? What's George, the I think, if I, st and Eric, I followed very closely because it matched exactly what Jay was telling me, and well, now what I knew, now understand. It matches what Jay tells you because, because it's Jay and I are with the same firm, and no, I'm no, no, but here, city here's attorney, my point, so. is that, it, and and that was my point back to Jay was city recommendations denial or or approval, and if I disagreed, all I need is to have that competent mm -hmm. testimony that gave me the the wherewithal to say you know what I disagree, and that's all that's all Erica or Jay or the law is saying is that as long as we have that now. Where, where and, you and get run me, into me, the issue, which you're talking about, <coughs> where this board has a 27% approval and some of the other boards had a lower, is one, variances are just that. They vary from the law. They should be rare, and they should be exceptions to the rule, not the rule. The difference is, based on the criteria, some of the decisions this board has made were not based on the criteria. They were based on what's been deemed as common sense or something outside of that, what this board felt should be considered instead of what the <coughs> law says you should consider. That's where the approval is a little bit different, and that's where you might get dinged by the law. If someone were to take an appeal and that goes to the circuit court and, the appellate, and they sit in their appellate division, they might look at that and say, there's no competent substantial evidence in this record whatsoever to support that the meeting of all these criteria. And in fact, the record demonstrates that they didn't make that decision based on those criteria. They made it based on something outside the criteria. Right. And there is a lot of case law on that where boards have been overturned and there have been substantial judgments um, based on that because the criteria were not adhered to. That's why we're asking the city to change those. Well, and Erica, That's exactly why. Erica, this is another point that I was trying to make with Jay and actually was uh, perfectly executed right here where the homeowner had the report. He had the smoking gun of the pre-approval thing. And Michael's right saying, well, it was, it was approved. We know it's approved. Everybody agrees it was approved. But had we been able to see that, that would have also been competent, substantial, saying he checked off the dimensions were correct. I don't know what a pre-approval poor form looks like. If it has that, great. If it doesn't, maybe it should. But my point was when we asked him if he had it, he didn't have it. It was 10 minutes away or something. We're not allowed to consider that anymore because that's not evidence he brought. My question then back that was brought up by somebody is, uh, why wouldn't we have it? Well, and I know it's not the staff's responsibility to provide that, but if it was a fully completed form and and I think, George, you mentioned, we got pictures of trees that are irrelevant. Uh, again. And they, they put that together, but the staff could have had 
they could have, but I don't control the staff report. No, I'm not right? saying you so do. So I don't tell them what to put in. <coughs> whether but do you see my point? Is that right, but you understand that this board is not, so there's three different parties to every application that comes before the board. There's staff, which is the city. There's the applicant, which is the citizen or the, the person. And then there's this board, which is an independent board. You guys do not represent the city or its interests, and you don't represent the, the person or its interests. You are supposed to be an unbiased, independent board that, you know, so whatever the staff puts before you is the evidence that they're presenting. You know, they don't have a burden, so they actually don't have to put anything together. They're just giving you the application. Why they put the trees in there, I don't know. Like I said, that was irrelevant. Right. Should they have put the pre-inspection report in there? I don't know. You know, that's, that really all that stuff lays on the applicant. They have the burden to prove that they meet the criteria, not that the staff doesn't have the burden to prove that they don't meet the criteria. And I'm totally right there with you. However, when we're talking about lawsuits and if we did the right thing or if we followed the law correctly, um, it, it's my contention that the, the staff needs to be held accountable for that, and yet if we would have done that, if we would have followed that, I believe that we would have exposed ourselves more so to a lawsuit. Personally, that's just me, because that gentleman had a document saying that it was approved and it was okay. Well, let's be clear. Forward. The law on whether or not a city <coughs> makes a mistake and what happens in the building inspection process has nothing to do with this board. If he thinks that that was wrong and he su suffered some type of damages, he can certainly consult an attorney, but I will tell you it is the law is not favorable in his side. Um, so uh, th that, that's a whole different issue, and you and I can talk about that outside of this board. I, I understand, but, and I, but I wouldn't what have, I'm I wouldn't have had the board responsible either. However, I don't think he would have come after the board. I think he would have gone after the city. And that's fine, and he has every right to do that <coughs> if he feels that that's the case. And like I said, you and I can talk about that after the meeting, and, and I can okay. you know tell you what happens with that. <laughs> But what, the, the purpose of this board is you're just to consider the evidence that's presented to you. You're not supposed to do any fact-finding on your own. I know we've talked before about doing site visits and how you're not supposed to talk about it if you do it because that's technically evidence. You're not supposed to present evidence. But really, you're not supposed to do any fact-finding on your own. You're not supposed to Google anything. You're not supposed to request things from staff. You're not supposed to do independent research. It is on the applicant. The applicant is the one who, needs to, who has the burden albeit sometimes they are, you know, a majority of the time they're very inexperienced. They're just homeowners. They're not contractors. They're not attorneys. They're not agents that do this on a regular basis, but sometimes they are. But the law is the law. It doesn't matter what, what you know, what walk of life you come from, that it, the burden is on them. Staff works with a lot of these applicants to, to get to the point where they try to make it work. You know, that's why a lot of your applications or a lot of staff reports say uh, approval because they've worked with them to try and get them to the point where they, you can approve something like that. You know, but at the same time, they're bound by the law. Y'all are bound by the law and the applicant has the burden to provide that. So for you to say, let's continue it so staff can give us that pre-inspection report, which might have made a difference, doesn't matter. The applicant didn't provide that to you, mm -hmm. which means you're not to consider it. And it <coughs> might have been really helpful. But it, unfortunately, that's not, that's not up to you. Once again, that's why we asked as a board for the commission to change the law so that it would give us the flexibility to do what had to be done. And that's right. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this and, you know, I'm just thinking as a, you know, I'm not a horrible, heartless person. I mean, heck, I'm in the middle of a construction project myself. Like I said, I love that this was approved. But the one thing, you know, why I voted no is because in the interpretation of, you know, the, the first point, of, you know, the need for the requested variances, is, you know, arises out of physical surrounding, shaped topographical conditions, you know, that one, it's a no. All the others were a screaming yes. Logic was a screaming yes, but it's, I feel just our, our hands are tight. And, I'm, you know, it's not, you know, any person's fault. It's like we said, us going, you know, through the motions that we have to try to get some changes to this because. <laughs> You know, these are our marching orders. I wanted to answer your question, John. Um, even if we had the report um, on a permit, specific permit, all it will say is uh, preform, and the inspector will just put his initials there. There's no 
There's um, not a checklist. There's no there. checklist. There's no detail. There's, so even if he had given it to us, that's why I said um, it would have had no relevance to this case. Uh, all they do is they put an initial. It's JW, DW, you know, uh, ME. That's it. Wait, so you've seen one of these? And you're saying there are no measurements on it? None whatsoever. So he could just get out of the car, do one of these? He doesn't Looks even have good. to take a, a ruler and, and put anything on it. He could just check it off. Mm -hmm. Can I say one more thing? Since the city gave, <coughs> uh, permitted the homeowner to do this, doesn't that automatically set him up as a contractor of his own uh, property that he has to upgrade? Doesn't that automatically put the city, the city's responsibility of what inspections have to come after that, that have to be targeted on a ball instead of missing it here? Maybe it there? <coughs> you already permitted the, the, the homeowner to do it. So does the city have a responsibility to make sure the Florida building and its ordinances are met when, you're, <coughs> when it's doing inspections and doing permitting? Yes. Yeah. Are mistakes made? Yes, people are people. Then Does the city logic. have liability there? I'd be happy to talk to you about that after the meeting. But we're using logic, and the logic is... You're not to use logic. You're to That's use the, the criteria. That's the, the problem. Because <laughs> logic, logic says logic yes. Logic was used on this side. Look, the criteria look, was used you know, on this side. We, 1502B1 says no. We've been through this a million times, and, and, and Vice Chair Verbosky is correct. We have, you guys have brought this before the commission, and, and you will see you know, what happens with that. But as of right now, this board is bound by the law, and the law is the law, and I am here to be the bad guy and remind you guys of how this is the law. And I know it's a terrible situation, and I'm not opposed to being the bad guy. I am doing do it job, every day, though. man. I yes. do it every day. <laughs> so, but in all honesty, if you guys have questions about this, I mean, aside from the fact that you disagree with the criteria, if you do have legitimate questions, even within the criteria or what any of these things mean, I am happy to answer any questions well, I think for you. I'm not the bad guy here. Our board, no, it's not us against you or us against city staff. It's about fixing what's wrong. So we're asking the commission to fix the law so that these sorts of things won't be uh, a problem. Also, we're asking the city staff to please inspect whatever it is you're supposed to be inspecting and get it right to the best of your ability. And yes, mistakes can happen, but we have to minimize that. So, and learn from our mistakes. I mean, this, let's not have this happen again. I've, I've personally had people come to me and tell me that there, there were no in-process inspections done while the roof was put on and they were very upset about that uh, and, and again well so again the, they it's need just to something that, that needs to be to this needs to be addressed instead of saying hey let's not talk about it i say let's talk about it let's address it and then it won't come back up and we'll change the law and that will fix the other problem aside from the law again when you look in the code what this board is designed to do and what you are allowed to do the whole code thing that's an anomaly and, and you guys are, are giving you're getting special exception to do that and that's great that's what the board of commissioners has allowed you to do as far as recommending and telling staff what they need to do for with their inspections that is not the purview of this board if you want to go as a private citizen to the building department or to the city manager or to the commissioners and let them know that you have a problem with that and they should look into it you can do that but this board is not it is not in the it is not the power and duties of this board to do that if you catch that and you want to bring it up as a private citizen you can but legally speaking, your powers and duties do not allow you to do that with regard to inspecting. But he's sitting in the chairman's seat right now at a public hearing under board comments. So, look, again, y'all can be mad at me. I am the lawyer. I, I'll take all the jokes you got. Trust me, my dad will love them all. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just here to tell you guys what the law is and what it's not. It's not that we have a problem with the city or you. Or, it's just frustrating. Right. And I understand for that. For the citizen, over but seven, I hear you're not advocating inches. for the citizen either. You need to that this board has to keep that in mind too. Is that while you might feel for that applicant coming up here, and you can see yourself in their shoes, being somebody that's coming before this board, you are not here to advocate for that applicant. Right. You're not here to advocate for the city. You are here to be an impartial board and follow the law. You're basically this is going to sound terrible. Don't take offense. You're robots. You're here to take in evidence. Apply it to the law. I mean, you're your judge. A judge doesn't put themselves in the seat of the defendant or in the, of the plaintiff. The judge is, impor is impartial, listens to all the evidences presented, looks to the party that has the burden and says, have you met your burden? 
That's and, exactly what your job is. You're not supposed to be here and saying, <coughs> I wish I had this, this, and this. Go get it for me so I can find for you. That, you can't do that. And that was actually what helped clarify it for me when I talked to Jay, because when I started here, my very first meeting, it came to me as the first, the first vote, and I voted no, and everybody else voted yes. But I was almost under the impression that the staff recommendation was 99.9% .9 correct and true. And I've sat in the, the seat and felt the staff has been wrong. Even in, I've only seen a handful. And even in the handful, I've seen things that I would have considered a mistake. And this one was one also. And that's why it, it kind of clarified it to me when it's competent, substantial evidence. I've, and, and that's all the Erica, Jay, the city, our board, is if I, in my position, feel that competent, substantial evidence was to go against what the staff was, shouldn't be a problem. And it's what the law considers competent, <coughs> substantial, and relevant, not what you personally think is competent, substantial, and relevant. Right. Which is, it's a hard distinction to make. But, you know, tonight's application was an interesting one. And, you know, I can't tell you if you made the right decision or not. I can tell you what I think. Oh, I'm not going to tell you what I think my decision would have been. But I think that, you know, it, this is a good discussion that we're having. You know, I think that, I think that a lot of these things, um, you know, regardless of what the law is, y'all are bound to this now. If it changes, then you'll be bound to something different. If it doesn't, you're still bound to what the criteria are. So we just got to make our peace with what we've got right now and move forward. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. And for both of you who had questions about with the city's liability or inspections, I'm more, more than happy to answer any questions after the meeting. Thank you. Any more board comments? Yeah, I, I think this discussion was beneficial and at least for me and hopefully helpful for us as we continue to <coughs> um, get a better understanding of our roles. And, um, you know, this is our Bible and we'll see. I mean, it's the, the Old Testament and we're hoping that we get the New Testament. So. And with that, we're adjourned. Okay, can I put my real opinion out then? <laughs> What do you mean? You weren't saying what your real opinion was? I don't know. They, they, they hold back so much.